And so last week, we talked about the fact of two things, that one, that the body is there to strengthen the body, that, that, uh, that when you work out, you're, it's not just your chest that lifts weights or your, you know, certain muscles, your, your hands, your arms, there's different parts of the body that when you work out, that it, it helps strengthen the other parts of the body. And the importance of, of finding our role and finding our spot and how that, that the body can strengthen each other, especially through small groups, through encouraging one another. Remember, we talked about how the role of the church is not to tear down people and condemn people, but the, the, the role of the church is to build people up in their faith, to, to speak life over them and to call them up uh, into the relationship that God would have for them. And then the second thing we talked about last week was that the body heals the body, that God created our physical bodies, that when there is a wound, when there is something, that it moves into action and begins to send more blood flow or begins to send uh, different types of, of blood cells and things in order to bring healing to that area of the body. And, and we're gonna kind of continue with that thought today a little bit, and, and really just understanding the, the fact that our bodies can have as much healing as we want. That, that in, in, the, in the body of Christ and in our spiritual body, that we really get to choose the level of healing and what we want from God. Like, there's so many people in the church today that, that are just perfectly content to be saved when God doesn't just want to have us saved, God wants to bring healing into our life from past wounds and traumas and hurts and, and, and all of that. Even in Scripture, you will see encounters where, where Jesus really, he, he knew what the answer to the question was, but he gave the opportunity to the individual to decide whether they wanted to be healed or not. Uh, one of those places is in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethesda. The man had been there for, what was it, 37 years or so, and he's laying there, and Jesus is talking with him, and he said, I've never had anybody help me into the water so that I could <clears throat> find healing, and I've never been able to, to get in there. Somebody always gets to the water before me, and Jesus just looked at him and said, will you be made whole? Like, just put the question, in. of course he wants to be made whole. That's why he's been coming to this place for 37 years. He definitely wants to be made whole. But Jesus didn't force his healing upon him. He asked him, is this what you want in your life? And it's the same thing with us. God, he wants to bring healing in our life. But he's not going to force himself in the areas in our life that we don't want to allow him in. Mark chapter 10 is another story of the blind uh, man named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is blind and he's crying out for the son of David. He's a, you know, he hears that Jesus is coming by and he's crying out for him. And, and, and he, they tell him that people try to tell him to be quiet. He just keeps on going. And, and finally, they, Jesus tells him to come over to him. And when he comes over to him, he can see that he's blind. But Jesus looks at him and he's like, what is it that you would have me do for you? And I'm sure his disciples are like, Jesus, do you not notice the cane? Do you not, like, I mean, like, come on. Like, we are not the, we're just fishermen. We're not the smartest people in the world. And we can figure out this guy is blind and he needs healing. But Jesus didn't just force himself on him. You know, in, in our physical body, we, we can kind of choose the level of healing that we want in our physical body. Sometimes we just deal with certain things in our, in our body, certain aches, certain pains, you know, there, there's sometimes there's things that you can do that would make things better, and, you know, we're just not willing to do that. Earlier this year in, in January, I was playing basketball, and I was running down the court. All of a sudden, I just felt like something just kicked me in the back of the heel, and I just pulled up, and I, like, I, I knew, like, something was not right. I, I knew, uh, you know, I, I couldn't push off on that foot, and it was just kind of Week and everything, and so I go and I sit on the sideline, and and uh, and everybody's like, "Why, why are you over here?" Because you know, normally I'm just, if there's an opportunity to play basketball, I'm going to go the whole time. I'm going to wear myself out doing it. And, and I was like, "I can't go." Like I, I felt something in in my leg, and I had a calf injury and had an Achilles injury and everything. And so after about eight weeks or so, I was I was hoping like I could just. Uh, allow it some time to bring healing so that I wouldn't have to 
potentially go do surgery or anything. I didn't want to go do any MRIs or anything like that because I was afraid that I would have a tear that would need surgery and just kind of lagging along and just letting it uh, heal up and, and hope that it's getting better. And it's really not getting better at all. And we have a, a guy in the church who's a physical therapist. And, and early on, after I hurt my leg, he said, you need to just come over. You know, we've got an ultrasound machine. We can kind of see what's going on there as, as to what's going on. And then we can, you know, we can do some dry needling. We can do some different things in there and, and, and you know, help it out. And I was like, yeah, 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 okay. And, and I kind of didn't listen because I was just like, well, I'm going to rest it and give it the time. And, and just if I rest and give it time, it's, it's going to heal up and it's going to be fine. But after about eight weeks and I still can't push off that foot and, 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 you know, can't go up on my toes and stuff. I was like, this is not getting, this is not going to be fine. And go and start the process. And, and I go into it. And, and he begins to, to do this, uh, uh, do dry needling and, and do all these different things onto my leg. And for those of you who don't know what dry needling is, it's exactly what it sounds like. You take a needle and you start poking into the, the muscles and everything. And the reason why you poke into those muscles, I remember the first time he, he uh, put the needle into the back of my Achilles, it felt like somebody was ripping my Achilles out and like my, that, it started spasming really bad and, and everything. And, and, but then after the next couple of days, you started feeling better, started feeling better, go back and do some things and, and everything. And, and in the course of three to four weeks of, it, and of attention, onto the injury, then I was able to do the regular exercises and able to get back to doing things. Why? What, what was all those things? If everything that he was doing with the dry needling, everything he was run, running, like laser therapy over it, he was doing different things, everything that he was doing was bringing blood flow to it. And see, in order to bring healing into our lives, we have to create some natural blood flow. And in our spiritual life, there's got to be some blood flow that's created that, that, that allows the healing because it's in the blood that has the, the, the red cells and the white cells and the different things that you need that's going to be, begin to bring. It's all transported in the blood. That's why certain uh, parts of your body, like different tendons and things, they don't heal up. It's because they don't have natural blood flow that are flowing through them and, and so they don't, they don't repair as quick as what other, what other parts of the body is. And I remember when I went in to him the first time, he was like, hey, like, can you take some pain? Can you deal with some pain? And, 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 and I was like, yeah, I can deal with that. And he was like, well, let me ask you this first before we even go do any of this. Like, what is your goal in this? Like, how, how healed do you want to be? Like, you just want to be functional and just walking around and, and just kind of making it? Or do you want to be able to go play sports and stuff again? I said, I'm, I'm only in my 40s, and I got a, a daughter that's seven that I hope will uh, like basketball one day. So I got to be running around with her at least up into my 60s or so to, to be able to play. So, yeah, like, I'm, I'm not hanging it up. I'm not ready to retire yet. I still want to go. And he was like, all right, well, can you take – can you take a little bit of pain? And I was like, whatever it takes, I want to be able to get where I need to be. And then once he put that first needle in, I was like, and that Achilles starts pulling and it started getting off. And then the next, that evening, the whole day, I was like walking around like this. I was like, man, I'm in worse shape than I was before. But the next morning I woke up and I was like, man, like I can move my foot. Like this is because I was intentional about it. See, there's healing in the blood. And even in the Old Testament covenant days, I want to show you some things that, that relates to the, that there's different sacrifices and stuff that were made in Leviticus chapter 8. We see one sacrifice that was made in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 11. It says that they brought a lamb for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons, they laid their hands on the ram, and they killed it, and, and, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar and all around it. And when he did this, when the, when the blood was being sprinkled upon the altar, the blood was being sprinkled upon the altar for forgiveness. It was, it, it was what made a way for you to kind of be in the presence of God was the, the, the blood sprinkled on the altar signal, uh, 
signified forgiveness, but he didn't just stop there. In verse 23, it says that, that, that there, they had another ram, and they took it, and they slew it, and, and he took the blood of it, and he put it on the tip of Aaron's ear. He put it on the, the thumb of his right hand, and he put it upon the great toe of his right foot. Now, this is different than the initial thing because this second uh, thing, the second offering that's being made was not a, a thing for forgiveness, but the second offering that was being made was for consecration. It was for being dedicated to the work of God. And it said that they didn't just take the, the blood and sprinkle it upon the altar. They put it upon the ear. They, they put it upon the thumb. They put it upon the, the right toe. And I read a commentary and it said that when the blood was being applied to the hands and the, 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 the head and the, the feet of the priest, it was in effect symbolizing that they were dedicating their whole body, that, the, that all of the sins that they had made, that they had done in their body was being forgiveness. But it also signified that from that point on, that the priest was, was setting apart his ears and dedicating his ears to be willing to hear the voice of God. That he was dedicating his hands to be willing to do the work of God. And he was dedicating his feet to walk out the path that God had laid out before him. It was a different level of consecration. It was a different level of healing. And so many people in the church, in the body of Christ, have been content with just forgiveness of sin. But God doesn't want us just to stop at forgiveness of sin. He wants to change things in our life. You know, the blood of Jesus being applied is all you need for forgiveness. In 1 John 1, uh, verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light and we have fellowship with him and the blood of Jesus, that it will purify us from all sin. And we need that forgiveness from all sin, and we need to be purified from all sin. But God didn't just desire that we would just be sinners saved by grace. God called us all to be a priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it said, You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people of God's possession, to proclaim the virtues of Him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He, it, Peter is telling the, the Christians and the believers, listen, you are far more than just sinners forgiven by grace. You have been called. You're, you're a set-apart people. You're a holy nation. You're a royal priesthood. Your job is to go and to share about how God pulled you out of darkness and pulled you into marvelous light. And God's desire is that we would have the desire to not just have our sins forgiven, but to go deeper in that relationship with him to where we truly desire to be his hands and feet. We truly desire to realize that he's calling us to be even more. He wants us to be priests. He wants us to be light in darkness. He wants to bring healing in every area of our life. So that we can walk holy before him. Paul told the church in, Coloss in, in Colossians uh, chapter 1 verse 20. It says that through him uh, to be reconciled to himself. He wanted to reconcile to himself all things. Not just your sin. But your, your hurts, your pains, your sorrows, your griefs. All things. Whether they are here on earth or in heaven to make peace through the blood that was shed on the cross. That's why when they were calling them into this deeper walk and, and strengthening in the relationship with God, they applied it to, to the, the, the ear, the, the hands, and the feet is so that our ears would be open, our hands would be ready, and our feet would do the things that he's called us to do. In that verse, it said that you're a holy nation. You know, a lot of times when we look at the thing of being holy, many of us look at our life and we're like, you know what, I'm not so holy. 
I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't fit that role. Like I, I still have some faults, I still have some struggles, I still have some failures. But can I tell you something? Holiness is less about perfection and more about separation. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It, the word holy doesn't mean that you are perfect. The word holy means that you are separate, that you have been set apart for the purpose and the use uh, of God. And the body of Christ has got to begin to allow some blood flow to go through our lives to where we, we set ourselves apart. There's there should be some differences in between us and the world. There should be some differences in the way that we interact with people and, and the way that, that we respond to people and, 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 and all of that. Like there, 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 there should be some, some, some healing, some separation from the way that we used to be to the way that we are now. And when you look at our life and you look at our marriage, it doesn't just resemble everything that you already see in the world. Because we're not just struggling along, but we have separated ourselves for God's use. We're not just pursuing whatever the American dream is or more money or more fame or more position or more wealth or whatever, but we realize that every gift that God has given us like our hands have been set apart. We, we, we've dedicated them to God to use our hands for the building of his kingdom. Not just the building of our kingdom and what we want. And so the enemy will try to use all the time your imperfections or your faults and failure as a reason why that, or, or struggles that you have in your life as a reason why that there's no way that you would ever be able to do anything for the kingdom of God. I mean, let's be 100% honest. The, the majority of the reason why we don't tell people about Jesus, the majority of the reason why we don't step out and do things is because we're afraid that we're going to get out there and we're going to do it and we're going to fail. And we're going to make a mistake. We're going to say something wrong. We're going to act in a wrong way. We're going, to, we're going to do something wrong. And can I tell you something? You will. You will. I shared last week mistakes that I know that I've made as a pastor since being, becoming a pastor and everything. And, and it doesn't mean that no longer, well, now no longer is he ever able to do anything for God because he said that he had an anger problem. He said that he had this. You, it, 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 it doesn't eliminate us from that. What should separate us from that is the fact that when we struggle, that we don't struggle alone, we have other people that are with us that we reach out to, that we realize, hey, this is a struggle that I'm having and I need you to pray for me. And, and you know what? The, one of the biggest things that will separate Christians from unbelievers is the fact that when we make a mistake, we confess that we make a mistake. And we're not trying to cover it up. We just own up to it. And people will look at that and they'll be like, that's different. Throughout Scripture, you will not find one person that we idolize in our storybook Bibles uh, uh, that did not have major moral failures in their life at some point in time. None of them. And yet God moved in their life. David was an adulterer and a murderer and, and a horrible father. And it still says that David was one that was after God's own heart. Every single person that we read about. But what was the difference? They set apart. that When they would make this mistake or the failure, they didn't just go back into the world and stay in the world. Like, no, I've been set apart for God's purposes. And I'm going back, and I'm going back to allow God to move in my life, to bring healing into my life. 
in Hebrews, Hebrews tells a lot of, it compares a lot of the difference in between the old covenant and the sacrificial system and the, the new covenant through Christ as being the sacrificed lamb in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. It says, how much more then will the blood of Jesus Christ, through whom eternal spirit offered an unblemished to God, how much more will it cleanse our conscience from the acts that lead to death? Why would it cleanse us? So that we may serve the living God. The verse right before this, it says the the Old Testament ceremonial thing of sprinkling the the blood on the altar, it made you ceremonial clean. But now in the New Testament, because of the blood of Jesus being shed and and everything, it's not just ceremonial clean, but it can even cleanse your conscience to the point of where you're not going to perform the acts that lead to death. The root word there. For conscience, and when we think of conscience, we think of like Jiminy Cricket popping up or, or the, the little angel and the little devil on your shoulder and you got to choose which one. Listen, that, that's not what that, that word even means. The, the root word for the, the Greek word there in, in, for conscience means it changes the way you see things or the way that you understand things. I want to cleanse the way that you even perceive things. I want to cleanse the way that you understand things. And if you'll allow me to cleanse you at a conscience level, then you'll see things differently, you'll understand and comprehend things differently, and you're going to act differently. It's going to manifest its way. And He continues talking about this in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence to enter into the holy place, how? By the blood of Jesus. Notice every one of these things has to do with what Jesus already accomplished at the cross. The blood that has already been shed. It says, by a new and living way, he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through the flesh. You remember when Jesus was dying on the cross, and he gave up his spirit, it said that the veil in the temple, which was a curtain, the, the, the temple uh, had a veil uh, that went around an area called the Holy of Holies, and the only person who could enter into the Holy of Holies was a priest, and they could only enter in at certain times, and they had to go through all these sanctification processes and all this stuff that in order to even be able to go in, and, and, and they, they even had to have a rope tied around their foot that if, because if they would cut themselves or do anything wrong while they're offering the sacrifice, they would die immediately because they were in the presence of God. And when Jesus died on the cross, it says that that veil, that curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom. And it made a way for us to be able to be in the presence of a living God because of the blood that was applied to the doorpost, to the altar there. 21, it says, since we have this great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, a full assurance of faith. You see, when we make mistakes and when we fail, the last thing we feel like doing is drawing near to God. See, the enemy wants us to think we have to run away from God when we make a mistake or when we fail. And God's like, no, 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 no. When, when you fail, when you make a mistake, you need to draw nearer to me. Don't run from me. Run to me when you fail. Don't run from the body of Christ. Run to the body of Christ when you fell. Because that's the place where you should be able to find healing. It says, and our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. So let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful.
he gives us the thing when you're struggling, when you're hurting, when run to the presence. Draw near with hope and confidence in the assurance of faith. But can I tell you something? That's not just like come to church or pick up your Bible and read because he didn't, he didn't stop right there. The, the author continued on in verse 24. And he said, and let us now... Consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, which is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the days drawing near. He's saying the way that you run into the presence of God and the way that you that the body is supposed to work and you're creating that blood flow and stuff is to get with other believers and begin to stir one another, begin to encourage one another, begin to build up one another, begin to challenge people. It, we should see the life that other people live who are doing things for God and it shouldn't make us feel jealous. It should make us feel a desire to want to do that. We, we shouldn't look at people and condemn them for, for not serving or for not doing certain things. It, our, our job is to try to stir them up and to try to stir a hunger in their heart, to try to stir a desire in their heart to do good works and to love other people. And it says, don't forsake the assembling together. In other words, don't disconnect. You remember we talked about last week how if a part of the body disconnects and isolates, it doesn't bring healing, it brings death. And here he says, don't, don't do that. This is why it is important to be able to come into the house of God, but not only be able to come into the house of God, but be in your homes as well with other believers, stirring one another, encouraging one another, building one another's faith up and challenging them in works and in love. And it says, all the more as you see the day draw near. I mean, when you look at Scripture and you look at the wars and rumors of wars and you Look at, you see a great falling away, but you also see a great revival that's starting to stir up in people's hearts and, and lives. You see all these different prophecies that have been fulfilled and everything. You can see that more and more we are seeing the signs of the, the ages of the last days. And here he said, this is the time that you need to be with one another even more. That phrase, stir up, the way that we kind of look at it is that, you know, if you're kind of stirring uh, somebody into that, most of us would kind of think maybe to kind of encourage them there and, you know, to, to you know, stir something up, encouragement, build them up, let's, let's go do this and stuff. But, but what other way do we, when we read that, we read it with like a spiritual mindset of everything's got to be good, right? We're going to stir each other up, make this all good, build each other up, right? Anybody else read that verse that way or is that just me? But when we use that phrase, stirring up, do we use that in a phrase normally as they're being encouraging? No. We use it as in, they're stirring up trouble now. Oh, they're just trying to get things riled up. Oh, they're just trying to, you, you know. It, you know what? That's what the word means. It doesn't mean, Jeremy, I just want to encourage you. And be good faith. I just want to see what God's doing in my life. I, you need to do it in your life. You can do it and all that stuff. It doesn't mean that. It means to stir it up. Jeremy, what are you doing, man? Like, seriously, you have been in church long enough. You should know what you need to be doing in this. We've got to do this. We've got to pay it. This is about the kingdom. This isn't about what you feel right now. This isn't about this. It, it means that the, the word there in the Greek is paroxymos. The word paroxymos means to cause stimulation, to mean to bring provocation, irritation, or even an angry dispute. 
The root word of paroxymos that it's found from means to cause sharp disagreement. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought we were supposed to be together in unity, and now you're telling us we're supposed to be stirring each other up and having disagreements and all that. Listen. Any good, strong relationship has strong disagreements from time to time. Any good, strong relationship. It is the complete chaos and hell that me and Melody put each other through early on in marriage. It makes me love that woman so much. We celebrated 21 years this week, and I'm like, baby, I don't know how in the world you could put up with me for 21 years. And I'm sorry for 21 years. But it's the sharp disagreement. It's, the, it's the, the times when we didn't see eye to eye. It's the times when we were angry at one another that iron begins to sharpen iron and we both become more godly. Here's the problem in the church. The first sign of disagreement, we run. And we start post, uh, we don't like this about this church and this. And, and we start labeling all these different things. And, and we start naming everybody either a narcissist or, a, or whatever. Like it, it's all this divisive, divisive, divisive. And here it says we're not supposed to go and, and do all that. We're supposed to, if there's an issue in between us and someone in the church, we meet together And we have our sharp disagreement together. And as we have our sharp disagreement together, we're going to find a middle ground. And because of that, we're both going to be stronger. See, it's the tension that makes us stronger. When you lift weights, you don't just press it up and get momentum going. We're curling up like this, and you get your whole body going. That's not helping you. It's taking it slow and pulling it up slow and releasing it slow. It's the time under tension that is developing and drawing more strength. And if we just run then we have no time under tension and we are going to be weak. And he said that in the last days is a time when we need each other even more than ever. This is not the time to be dividing about things. This is the time to have conversations about things, to spur one another in love, with the purpose and the heart of reconciliation or restoration. Some of the people who I know love me the most are the people that I have disagreed with the most. And when there's been conflict, when there's been disagreement, and you can work through that, See, that's beside the fact that my wife is absolutely drop dead gorgeous. That is not the reason that I stay with her and I'm not attracted by some young 20 year old. There is nobody else who has seen the worst of me and yet loved me. There is nobody else who has seen the worst in me and encouraged me. And so it doesn't matter what anything else looks like. It's not going to pull me away 
Because this, I know, is not counterfeit. This is a real deal. And it should be that way in the body. When we've gone through things. Listen, the majority of the people who've been on staff with us, we've had disagreements. Me and Pastor Q have had disagreements. And we've had words, but us working through the disagreements makes the relationship even stronger. Me and Jeremy have had disagreements. There's been things that I, decisions that I made that he's just like, Pastor Brandon, I don't know about that. I, and we'll have the conversation and we'll work through it. And I know specifically those two guys, they ain't going nowhere. Because we've been through some stuff together. That's why people in the military, they, they, like, they, they went through and, like, and, and fought in foxholes and stuff with people. Those people are lifelong friends because of the chaos that they've been through. We want the victories without the chaos. We want everything to be without tension. But it's the tension that brings strength. We were talking about this the other night. Melody is on the, the youth worship team. and she, I don't, I don't, she looks like a youth, but she's a little bit older than that. And we were just talking about even within the church, that even within older generation and younger generation, that there's tensions that are there. Sometimes older generation judges the younger generation. Sometimes younger generation, they judge the older generation. It causes tension. Can I tell you something? That's exactly how God created it. Because it's in the tension that we can find balance and truly be who God created us to be as a church. You look at the churches, and a lot of churches are 60 years old and up, or 30 years old and under. And the reason why is because there hasn't been that balance of attention. Either the focus has been all toward the youth or all toward the older generation, versus realizing that there are things that the older generation can learn from the younger generation. They are a whole lot less judgmental than we are. But on the other hand, there are things that the younger generation can work, learn from the older generation. They are a whole lot tougher. The older generation is a whole lot tougher, work harder, persevere, press through, grind and get it done, don't quit mentality. But if we can find that middle ground where we all have that hard, ingrained work ethic and we all have the grace and the love without judgment, then man, wouldn't we be a whole lot healthier body? It's the tension. It's a time under tension. Part of the reason why you do time under tension is because it tears the muscles down more, which, what does it do? It creates more blood flow so that healing can take place and results can be faster. The question is, are there areas that we're going to allow more blood flow to go to? How much healing do you want in your life? Are you willing to press in, be a part of a group where there's going to be tension in things because you know that it's going to be able to grow? Are, Are there areas of your life that you're willing to open up whether it's hurts or wounds or unforgiveness or things, for the blood of Jesus to flow and touch that area, to bring healing to it. The question that God would ask the church today is I believe the question that Jesus asked the man laying by the well. Hey, you've been coming for 37 years. Some of y'all been coming to church seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years at iHeart. And God's still saying, will you be made whole? 
Will you open up and allow some areas for that blood to flow? Will you connect in? Stop just hearing these messages and open yourself up to where healing can take place.